three different things. Conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, and good old-fashioned projectile motion. And so um, the way this works, I have a ball here. Now this ball is, uh, has a mass. Let's call it mass M. Okay. So we'll say mass M. That's going to be a given. Now, in order to get the ball rolling, so to speak, we will put it on the end of this rod. And I'm going to do some work here. So the amount of work I'm going to do is, I'm going to do that by compressing a spring. Now when you compress a spring, let's talk about what happens. Um, Hooke's law says that the force on a spring is equal to K times X, where K is the spring constant, which indicates the stiffness of the spring, okay, is how, and then X is the distance that you compress it. And so if I'm going to hold a spring compressed at a distance X from its equilibrium point, it takes a certain force, F, to maintain that compression. So that's the force here. Now as I compress a spring, as you can see, as X increases, the force increases. So it's a nonlinear force. So therefore, I start out with a very smaller zero force at first, but as I go all the way into X, my final displacement, I have a force F. And so my average force, because this is a linear relationship, my average force is half of F. So going from zero to F, my average force is one half F. And so, um, so, uh, so as it turns out here, my average force is one half KX. Now if I'm going to do work on this spring, the work is equal to my average force times the distance of displacement X. And so uh, we know that average force is one half KX. So one half KX times X is one half KX squared. One half KX squared indicates the amount of energy that I've given to the spring. This is potential energy, stored energy of the spring. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to compress this with, a, with <coughs> an average force. It got harder the further I pushed in. And now it's locked. The spring has been compressed. How much has it been compressed? Well, I can measure that compression with the, um, with the plastic ruler. And I can see it's changed from its equilibrium point. The difference between its new position and the old position is, the, is x, the amount of compression. I don't know what k, the spring constant, is. All right, well, let's talk about energy a little bit. Now, when I release this, uh, pull this trigger, the spring is going to decompress. That spring energy, the, the potential energy of the spring is going to go from 1 half kx squared to 0 because it's no longer, no longer compressed. Well, that's going, that energy is going to be transferred into a change in velocity of the ball. And so along this same line, this flat line, this ball is going to pick up energy. Now right now the ball has no energy. Let's say, well, let's talk about the potential energy of the ball. Well, let's define where the ball is to be the zero, to be zero height. So I can say because of this, um, where I've chosen zero in height to be, this ball has no potential energy, no potential gravitational energy. And so right now it's not moving, it has no kinetic energy. And so when it starts moving though, the spring is going to push the ball forward and all that energy in the spring is going to be converted because there's very, very few or not many non-conservative forces at work. So let's just say if they're inconsequential, all this energy is going to be converted into the kinetic energy of the ball. So that 1 half kx squared, that's equal to 1 half mv squared, where m is the mass of the ball which is given to you. Now as this ball travels across through here, it's going to be dropping in height a little bit, so it'll actually be gaining a negative potential energy, so to speak. But let's, uh, let's say it's moving fast enough that it's really not dropping at all between the end of this, um, between when it starts off the end of the spring and when it collides with this little cup. So we're not looking at a very big loss in kinetic in, in, in height. So let's say its potential energy is still zero, it's not changing. And our kinetic energy, the ball is not really slowing down, so it has that same kinetic energy when it hits the cup. But when it strikes the cup and it lodges here in the cup, that's a collision. And we know the energy from one side of the collision to the other 
is not conserved. We verified this in the laboratory situation. So I'm going to put a not equal right here. This is not equal to, and so here's the collision. This is the initial energy. I'm going to say the initial energy is not equal to the final energy of the ball. Because in a collision here, energy is not conserved. And so now the energy is, once it hits the cup, let's say this cup has a mass of big M. That's the mass of the cup and the rod, okay? And it has a mass of big M. And so our new energy after this ball strikes, it's going to slow down, of course, because energy is lost. And our new energy is the kinetic energy of the ball and the cup together. So that's little m plus big M times V squared, but then we'll call this V2. And back over here, we'll call this V1. Um, so it has a new velocity, V2, and it begins to move in that direction. So that's the new energy. Now, something else is going to happen. <clears throat> you see I've got a little needle here? As this rotates, the needle moves. And what this does is it's measuring the angle of rotation. And so let's say it gets up this height and then stops and begins to swing and oscillate. Well, this needle measures theta. So theta is something we can determine. We can determine this angle here. And so let me sort of um, talk about why we might need theta. Let me pull this out of the way a little bit. As this pendulum, here's the pendulum in the cup, because that's big M. When the ball strikes, you see the ball goes into the cup, then it swings through this angle. Theta. So if we know what theta is, what we can do is this. We also know what the length of the pendulum might be, the length L. And L is something that's given to you or that you can measure. It's from the pivot point to the center of mass of the pendulum. You don't know really where the center of mass is, so we're just going to give you the value of L. And so if you know what L is, you can determine this side. L is the hypotenuse. Here's theta. You can determine the adjacent side of your triangle. And then the difference between L and the adjacent side of the triangle is this value, H, the height that this ball and pendulum combination has risen. It's risen a certain height off, the, off of the original point. And so at that point, it stops moving. It comes to a stop and goes back the other way. Now, when it comes to a stop, all the kinetic energy of the ball and the cup has gone to zero. And that means that all of that energy that was kinetic, it's now potential because it's raised a certain height. So that's all that kinetic energy that's actually at the top of the swing becomes equal to mgh. And the mass, of course, is a little m plus big M times g times h. And h is something we determine by knowing theta and L. We determine h. And so you've got this long string of stuff dealing with energy. Well, we can, uh, we can do a lot, but we're stymied here by this um, inequality. So let's say I knew what the height was now in G, and I knew what these masses were. And I can go back and say, I want to know what the spring constant is. I want to figure out K. Well, I can say, let's work our way backwards. And so I'll go down here, and I'll, get it, and I'll say, this, this is equal to this. All right, well, I'm setting this equal to that. I notice that I know a little m, the big m, I know, the, I know g, gravity. I know h, the height. I don't know velocity squared, but I can solve for this using algebra. And so I can tell you how fast this was moving after the collision. However, because of this inequality, I can't tell you anything that happened before the collision yet. Now, in order to make a bridge across the collision, we have to use the idea of conservation of momentum. Because we know that the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum in a collision. So this is going to help us out. Now the final momentum in the collision, because we now know this V2 from our previous calculation, 
I, you can tell me what the final momentum is. It's equal to mass times velocity, and where our mass is little m plus big M times V2. So this is the final momentum after the collision. Right after the collision, this is the momentum of the cup and the ball. And so before the collision, the only thing that was moving was the ball. The cup was stationary, but the ball was moving, it was going right here with a little m, mass, and a certain v, v1. And so before the collision, the total momentum of the system was little m times v1. And so what we've done, we, we can now go to here, to here, to here, and then bridge the collision, and now we know what v1 is with a little bit of algebra. If m, big M, and v V2 is known, we can solve for V1. Knowing V1, let's put it back up here into the kinetic energy just before the collision. One half little m V1 squared. Now we know what the energy was before the collision. It's greater than after the collision. Then we use momentum to bridge it. And so now we can go back and knowing this, we can, knowing what X is, our displacement of the spring, we can determine K, the spring constant, right? And also, what was our average force when we compressed the spring? We can calculate that. Now, one thing you might want to do is determine the range of a projectile. And so, if, if, I, wanted to, um, if I wanted to figure out how far this ball might go if it didn't hit the cup, let's say if the cup were out of the way and I just fired it straight across onto the floor, how far would it go? Well, what I need to know is the initial velocity of the ball. And it's a horizontal velocity. And so by knowing theta, by determining theta, knowing L, knowing big M, little m, I can calculate here to here to here to here. And once I get here, look, there's V1, this, the velocity of the ball before the collision. So if there were no collision, now I know V1, the horizontal velocity, and using projectile motion, there's something else I need to know, and that's the height of the ball off the floor. Now I can use the um, kinematic equations, or the range equations, that we have to, um, to determine how long it takes to hit the ground, and by that, how far out it will go. So I, I want to figure out where the ball will land. And so I can make that calculation using kinematics and, um, and make my prediction of where the ball will land. I can set a piece of paper there, put my line, and see how close the ball strikes to that line, which is my prediction of the range of this fired projectile, little m. So a lot of things you can do with the ballistic pendulum, and I hope you just come up here and have a little fun with it.